long days and pleasant nights, fellow fans of my favorite author of all time, Mr. Stephen King. Welcome to The Horror Show. My name is Jaime Fuego, and today is January 28th, which has some serious significance because approximately 40 years ago today, one of the most iconic, scarific stories in all of horror history made its first publication. That's right, Stephen King's third novel, the Shining. Yes, that's right. Take a gander at that, Fright fans. So this is a book that over the last four decades, and just a story in general, that has really just solidified itself as one of the most iconic, as one of the most frightening, and that is probably because of the fact that it was adapted into a very, very renowned film by Mr. Stanley Kubrick right there. And so I need to just give a little context here. So. About seven years ago, I realized that besides just being a fan of Stephen King's, uh, you know, adaptations, so, you know, the films and the TV series, miniseries, things like that, I wanted to get deeper into everything. And so Stephen King, as far as his literary printed work goes, all kind of ties in together, especially as you get later into his career. And since I was a big fan of stuff like The Stand and It and Salem's Lot being three of my absolute favorites, Pet Cemetery also up there, when I realized all of it tied in with this stuff, the Dark Tower business, that's when I took it upon myself to start from the very beginning. Even though I'd only read like The Stand and It and Pet Cemetery, I decided to start at the very beginning and read all of King's work in its printed order. So as it was actually coming out. So I went all the way to the beginning of Carrie there and I've slowly over the last seven years been going through everything and I am nearing the finish line. Guys, I am so flipping close and the book that I had up next was Dr. Sleep, which you guys probably can only see like half of here in frame at the moment, but yeah, so with Dr. Sleep being my next uh, entry in this very, very long, arduous, but so fulfilling journey, I was like, well, maybe, even though I've read it already, I think I should give it another look just so, you know, if there's cool references, maybe some things would go over my head since it had been years and years since I had read Stephen King's third book. So I reread The Shining this past couple weeks and then as I was about to start Dr. Sleep, I'm just on the Wikipedia and I see that, holy smokes, we are about to hit the 40th anniversary this Saturday, which is today, right now. That's kind of ironic, isn't it? You know, so very, very, uh, very, I guess, conveniently timed, so to speak. And so I was like, I need to do a retro review and just a retrospective about everything that is The Shining. And so after the book was originally published in 1977, three years later, Mr. Stanley Kubrick bought the rights. And so he already had done amazingly iconic stuff like 2001, he'd done Dr. Strangelove, he'd done A Clockwork Orange, he had done Barry Lyndon, and yet that wasn't very successful, you know, that amazing period piece that was insanely long. So he was looking to kind of, I guess, compete with like the exorcists of the world and the Rosemary's Babies and the Omens and stuff like that. And so in 1980, he adapted rather loosely Stephen King's novel, which is here. And so one thing that I'm gonna do at least briefly First and foremost, I really, really recommend reading the novel, but I also recommend both the film version, as despite being very, very different, but I also recommend the miniseries that is actually celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. So that was where Stephen King, he was not happy with the alterations, with the approach that Kubrick took, and so he was like, I'm gonna script my own version for TV, and Mick Garris had done great work with The Stand, and he's helped out Stephen King with a lot of his adaptations. I believe he also did Desperation, uh, Bag of Bones, which wasn't that good, but Desperation was pretty damn good, and so, uh, but that all came later, but, so in 1997, he writes a teleplay, and that's what Mick Garris adapted, and that one was much more faithful to the themes of the original novel, and so we're gonna discuss the pros, the cons, a little bit of the differences and stuff, and so everybody knows that this book was very autobiographical, so it's about a struggling former teacher named Jack Torrance and his wife Wendy and their son Danny. Danny has a gift. Um, uh, thankfully, I think I can say The Shining here. I don't have to go The Shining or anything like that. You know, I'm thankfully not going to get sued, at least here on YouTube, for that reference. But no, no, go easy on the wee one. His father's going to go crazy and chop them all into haggis. What's haggis? <gasps> Boy, you read my thoughts. You've got The Shining. You mean Shining. Shh. You want to get sued? So, 
yeah, they moved to this um, Overlook Hotel, which is like in the Rockies of uh, Colorado. And the autobiographical aspect is the fact that King uh, was just a few years removed from being a struggling writer who also was a school teacher, who also was dealing with alcoholism and depression and presumed family tensions and stuff like that. He even dedicates this book to his son, Joe, uh, who all of you will probably know as uh, Joe Hill, the uh, you know current man who's making a name for himself in the literary and in the comic book world. So there was, there was a lot of self-reflection. He had even worked at a hotel in there, a like resort type hotel, I should say, in Colorado. So he was like directly, as he often does, combing from his own personal experiences. And one thing King said in, I believe, both On Writing and Dance Macabre, is his two uh, nonfiction books, is that gotta write what you know, man. You have to take that approach because that is often what will just seem the most genuine, it will have the most feeling. And so I think that's one of the reasons why this story as a whole is so damn good. The book is fantastic, but as books often are, it's very complex in comparison with what Stanley Kubrick did. Now, there's lots of similarities to the book, obviously, in both Kubrick's film and in the miniseries, but there are lots of key details that are pretty much just left out for, for time purposes. King is really big on, like, introverted introspection, you know, um, lots of flashbacks, lots of telling of stories and stuff like that. So things that you don't see in either the feature film version or the miniseries are the backstory of the marriage between, um, you know, Wendy and Jack. You don't really get much about his, uh, his history of drinking really in either. You get a little bit in the miniseries, but at least as far as the buddy who gets him the job, it's really grazed over in the, in the miniseries as far as, um, all the stuff that led up to the problems that uh, Jack encountered that actually drove him to, you know, go and take this job at the Overlook and, you know, trying to finish a new writing project, which is in the book, it's a play. In the miniseries, it's a play. Just to say once more, the miniseries is much more faithful as far as hitting specific plot points from the book itself. So there is a significant uh, interaction with some wasps when Jack is doing some stuff on the rooftop. That is a pretty big plot point and, you know, turns into a few things. And I, I feel like it's, uh, you know, kind of representative and a little bit allegorical and stuff like that as far as, you know, alcoholism being something that, uh, as opposed to a bee sting, which can just be one and done, a wasp is something that can just hit you over and over and over and over, sting you multiple times and just keep going and keep going because it's that ferocious and just that vicious. Um, that's actually uh, one of the biggest things that was omitted, I would say. And then another thing that was omitted in uh, you know, the Kubrick film that is in the book is the fact that uh, there's these hedge animals that kind of surround the Overlook itself and Kubrick replaced the hedge animals, which they did decently, I guess, in the Mick Harris. It's, some, it's early CGI, guys. You gotta remember it's 1997, but I still think it looked pretty good. But he replaced it in the Kubrick film with a hedge maze, and that actually turns into a big time plot point in the drastically different finale. Uh, but bottom line, the book is beautifully written and it has a lot of heart to it, which I think was one of King's biggest problems with the Stanley Kubrick version, is that it's very heartless in a lot of ways, and it's also more so pure terror as opposed to like, a downward spiral. You see a downward spiral, but in in the Kubrick version of the film, uh, you don't you don't really feel a lot of genuine love between the family. I mean, even even Shelley Duvall, like her and the the boy who plays Danny Torrance, also named Danny, that they. they it's just not as warm and loving as what you see in the miniseries. That's actually one thing that the miniseries did very very well was showing the genuine love despite the, the strained relationship, despite the tough history that they touch upon, you really genuinely believe that, first and foremost, at his core, Jack Torrance is a good person in the miniseries. Um, uh, the actor's name is eluding me. It's this guy from Wings. He does a pretty damn good job as Jack Torrance, though. He gives the warmth and the, the sweetness, but then kiss and kissin's what I've been missing. Also, he goes absolutely bat shizzle crazy and does a damn good job once he eventually gets to that. But the miniseries, mind you, is like four hours long compared to the Kubrick film, which is about two and a half hours. So 
you know, it is what it is. King was critical about the casting of Jack Nicholson also. He said, hey, this is a guy who did one, one Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest already. He, people are used to seeing him play crazy, so they almost like, they called it, they, they anticipated it. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of good in both the miniseries and in the feature film. Pros that I can say about the feature film, as far as adapting the book goes loosely, Damn, is it a just, it's absolute terror, you know? It is frightening, it builds an eerie mood, it, it feels much more cinematic. You can definitely tell, unfortunately, that this is a television miniseries and this is a feature film. It's a, it's a big sore thumb that just sticks out very, very easily. And you can tell the budget was nowhere near the same. Kubrick also alters a lot of stuff, like the fact that Ullman, the guy who is hiring on that Jack's character is actually nice instead of being a total bastardo. Tony is totally, totally creepier. Danny's imaginary friend, so much crazier. He also came up with iconic imagery that was not really in the books or in the miniseries, stuff like the elevator with the blood, um, you know, the here's Johnny, hedge maze obviously, creepy sound effects. And then also a really striking change that he made, and I'm sure there was some strange significance to it that I'm unaware of, is changing the just insane room where a lot of this evil power that dwells at the Overlook from 217 to 237. So 217 in the book and in the miniseries, and 237 in the Kubrick film is where an older woman who was having a soiree with this younger guy had killed herself in the bathtub, and I guess it's a room where just many evil deeds had gone down from, you know, mobsters killing each other and so on. And that's actually something that I must mention is that another big time plot point that was changed from the book for the Kubrick film is the fact that they only barely touch upon that alcoholism, but they also don't really give much history as to why the Overlook is so effed up in the Kubrick film. It, it just, you know, it's on Indian burial grounds and, you know, there were some skirmishes when it was originally being built and it's kind of one of those it is what it is type things and, you know, almost evil for the sake of evil and I guess maybe in some ways unexplained evil is much more frightening than when you see legitimate justifications for why people are doing terrible things and so it's an eerie dream-like film that really stands on its own in a lot of ways. I mean, it's it's considered by many to be one of the most iconic and best horror films ever made. It definitely earns its R rating compared to the miniseries and even the original book. I mean, you see full-on naked ghostly women, I mean, very sexy as well, um, at least until you see what's, what's really there. But Jack is dropping F-bombs, you know, cussing out Wendy. It's, it's just much harsher. There's also a lot more bloodshed beyond the stuff coming out of the elevator, which everybody knows about. And I always think of the, the South Park parody of it where Wendy, uh, or Shelly, I should say, <laughs> getting them confused. Oh, but Shelly Duvall played Wendy, so that kind of works out. But yeah, when uh, she's getting her first period and all the blood comes out, super, super funny. But yeah, um, the, the two twins getting killed, well, I guess they weren't quite twins. There was a slightly older sister and a slightly younger sister, but you see them just hacked to bits in the hallway and, you know, Danny envisions that. And so uh, I guess I must say that despite all of the changes, it made the film its own in a lot of ways, you know? It's, it's loosely based, as I've mentioned quite a few times at this point, but I feel like the stuff that it brought to the table as far as originality goes, you know, the, um, most most notably, I think the scariest scene in the entire film, which is all work and no play, makes Jack a dull boy. Yes, everybody wants to talk about the, here's Johnny, which we even saw recently in Mortal Kombat X when Johnny Cage, like, busted a hole through one side, you know, his opponent, and then, like, peers his face through. So hilarious. In fact, it shows how iconic this story is because it's been on The Simpsons, it's been on Gilmore Girls. There are two different music videos by uh, both Slipknot and 30 Seconds to Mars, Jared Leto's band. So yeah, that shows how iconic it is, the fact that it just keeps showing up in pop culture. I think it was even in that, they had the twins in, like, Angry Birds. So totally, totally ridiculous, right? But that that is the scariest scene in the entire movie for me because this new bit of written work that he's been working on, because they leave it very vague, as I mentioned, it's a play in the book and in the miniseries, but when Wendy goes to look at it and the entire big fat stack is all, and it's indented and paragraphed and all this other stuff, nothing but all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, or uh, what I probably prefer, all no TV and no beer make Homer something something go crazy. Don't mind if I do. What do you think, Mark? All I need 
need is a title. I was thinking along the lines of no TV and no beer make Homer something something. Go crazy? Don't mind if I do! I love The Simpsons. Sorry guys, that is the best Treehouse of Horror that has ever been made. But yeah, so the stuff that Kubrick added from the hedge maze crawl at the very end to, you know, the, the here's Johnny and the, you know, all work and no play thing and the elevator and the twins. I mean, these are stuff that, these are just aspects of the film that he made his own. And that's why even though I'm, as a King purist, I probably more so than anything prefer the book itself. I cannot deny just the influence and the lasting impression of absolute terror. Once again, I keep coming back to that T word that Kubrick crafted because he was one of the greatest directors that has ever lived. It's beautifully shot. It's an incredible movie. It's interesting that King really, really wanted to go back to those core themes and redo it. It obviously shows that the story was very close to his heart, and it was obviously close to his heart if he wrote a sequel that came out in 2013 called Dr. Sleep. But if I'm gonna mention stuff that the TV series did right, it's definitely the genuine love of the family, which makes the downward spiral that much more depressing and sad. There's a, like an, a feeling of despair. It's something that's been up for debate for a very, very long time amongst film fans. That's why there is a documentary, I believe, called Room 237, which is just all about weird interpretations of some of the symbolism within The Shining, that odd dreamlike nature of it, um, the fact that Kubrick was all about things not being surface level at all, you know, from, from the camera work to, the, to, I mean, all over the place, different visual aspects, and so, yeah, it's, it's a little bit more straightforward, but I enjoy the straightforwardness of the fact that the destruction of the Overlook that does not transpire in Kubrick's film, but, you know, the, the boiler room exploding and all those things from the book. Yeah, once again, Kubrick really made something his own, and that's why I feel like you can enjoy them both. You don't have to be one of these people who's like, oh, you know, I like Marvel, I like DC, or, you know, whatever. I enjoy this book very, very much. I absolutely adore it. It's not in my absolute tops as far as King stuff goes, but it's fascinating and it's it's got a lot of heart to it. And yet Kubrick did something drastically different in a lot of ways that I think holds up for much different reasons, but for ones that are just as important. So here on the 40th anniversary, I gotta first and foremost extend a grande gracias to Mr. Stephen King for having the ability to create something so so beautiful, so frightening, that has stood the test of time, whether adapted to something different by one of the best directors of all time, or, you know, Mick Garris, very competent and awesome in his own right. But first and foremost, if you have never read The Shining, please, please read it. It is a tremendous book. It's got humor, it's got good scares, and uh, there's a reason why Dick Halloran pops up again in Doctor Sleep, but also in a very small cameo in Stephen King's It in a flashback. So, I've been Jaime in Fuego. I gotta extend a grande gracias to all of you fans of the scarific excitement that I adore so very much. You can find me, Jaime in Fuego, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. I have my own channel called Enfuego Tainment. Jump over, like, share, subscribe, show some love. It is always supremely appreciated. Make sure to do the same here on the horror show. If you have uh, thoughts on The Shining, please comment below. I would love to hear your impressions about you know both the mini series, the feature film, and this fantastic book. Uh, that is a beautiful deluxe edition by the way that subterranean press did that i've been sitting on since i first purchased dr sleep so if you can track it down it might be out of print but it's got beautiful illustrations it is tremendous my next book is dr sleep and i look forward to maybe doing a review about that here for the channel so once again until next time freight fans hasta luego sin amigos that's right i hope it is sooner rather than later and until that hour transpires stay scared and read stephen king